Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the first of three sessions on control charts. Control charts are a very important tool uh, in the fields of both monitoring, evaluation, and control and quality control. We'll take this subject in three sessions. The, in the first session, we'll discuss some fundamental concepts which are essential to the understanding of control charts. This session will culminate in defining a chart of types of control charts and their purpose. Broadly speaking, control charts can be categorized into two, control charts for shift and dispersion and control charts for defects and defectives. And we'll take up these charts separately in session two and three respectively. So let's look at uh, the basic uh, concepts. The first concept is variation, variation from the ideal. And here we'll discuss common causes and assignable causes. If we look around at anything movable or anything in fact also immovable, we find that their performance degrades over a period of time or their performance degrades from the ideal. And this is what is being referred by the word variation, variation from the ideal. Take any machine, as it ages, its performance reduces, both in terms of efficiency and effectiveness. Take the human body. It is not as fit in 50s or 60s as it is in 20s and 30s. On a brand new car, you don't find any oil spillage beneath the car in the morning. But on an old car, you do find it. So as the time proceeds, then there's a degradation, degradation of performance or variation from the ideal. It is but natural and there is hardly anything that one can do about it. These are also referred to as random causes or random variations and natural causes or natural variations. Then there are some assignable causes. I just mentioned that you don't expect to find oil spillage underneath a, car, underneath a new car in the morning. But what if you do find? Well, then that is a cause of concern. You would like to investigate it. Similarly, if a young man in his 20s or 30s isn't that physically fit, he's unable to run, he's unable to exert physically, that is a cause of concern that needs to be investigated. So such causes, which are not due to act of nature, but there is a reason behind that variation are referred to as assignable causes. This can be depicted in a graph. Here is a simple process. Uh, this is the center line is the ideal uh, where you expect the process to be, but as the time proceeds, then of course, this variation starts increasing. These are the limits within the process is taking place. Uh, when the plant, the machine, or the human body is new, uh, these limits are very close to each other or the variation is small, but uh, with the passage of time, uh, the performance degrades and these uh, control limits within which the performance is taking place start receding away and away from the center line. So basically, if you look at this chart, there are some black dots and some red dots. Everything inside the control limits, which is denoted by black dots, reflect common causes. Uh, 
if we take uh, human body, this would be blood pressure, which is varying uh, with the uh, with the time of the day, very very normal. And of course, as the human ages, this variation becomes more and more. Outside the, these limits are abnormalities. What you don't expect to find. Here is a case where the blood pressure has fallen outside the lower limits, or in this case, it has it has shot up. Now, these are the these are the points, or these are the occasions where you like to investigate these variations because these are not natural. That means there is a problem which needs to be investigated. But you do find a red dot between the control limits as well. That means it is not a natural cause. This assignable cause is what is very dangerous because it is very difficult to detect. For example, in a, every day, when, let's say the blood pressure is fluctuating between uh, limits. And let's say this particular fluctuation is not due to the normal fluctuation. It is due to some reason. And that reason, because one thinks that it is within the limits, one wouldn't investigate. Therefore, it won't be detected. But this could be a trigger for some, uh, some more dangerous action. Uh, but unfortunately, this cannot be detected. So in a nutshell, this graph represents that assignable causes are outside the or what are the outside the control limits the common causes or the natural causes are what are inside the control limits however there could be an assignable cause within the limits also which obviously cannot be detected the next concept is uh, types of data, discrete data or attribute data, and variable or continuous data. There are things which cannot be measured. They can only be counted, or about which we can say yes or no, true or false, good or bad, hot or cold. But there are things which can be measured. You can measure the height weight, density, and so many other things. The things or the information or data which cannot be measured, it can only be expressed in discrete figures or expressions like good or bad, yes or no, two or three, uh, like, two or, like two people or two, pe two persons. There can't be two and a half persons. Uh, they cannot be fractionalized. Uh, three houses, eight cities. This is attribute data or discrete data. But then there are many other things like you can measure the uh, density of air, the height of a person, the, the weight of a bag. This is continuous data. Often the two types of data exist together. For example, take five bags of cement, five bags of cement. So five is discrete data or attribute data, but each bag of cement can also be measured. Its weight can be measured, its breaking strength can be measured, which in that case would be continuous data or variable data. And of course there are separate charts for attribute or discrete data and variable or continuous data. The next concept is the defect and defective. Well, one could say that defect is a noun and defective is an adjective. Yes, yes, so, but it has a slightly different connotation in the realm of control charts. Defect is any abnormality, any aberration, any shortcoming in any, anything, in any item, any deliverable. And here there are countless examples uh, mentioned over here what a defect is. If an item has a defect, 
it becomes defective or a non-conforming item. Let's say uh, a, the battery of a car is flat. That is a defect. That particular defect makes the car defective. So one or more defects make an item defective. A defective shirt, here's an, another example, a defective shirt has such defects as broken stitch or missing button or skip pitch or fading color, etc. So this is essentially the difference between the two. And in fact, this is important because there are separate the control charts for defects and defectives. Defects and defectives can also be discussed uh, in the context of another very important concept called the DPO or defects per opportunities or DPMO, defects per million opportunities, uh, which are very important concepts in quality control. Let's look at them. Say this is a form, any survey form, it has 20 entries. And this survey form is given to a class of 60 students to fill in. Once the students have filled in the form and returned to you, on scrutiny you find that 50 of those 60 forms are correctly filled in all 20 entries correctly filled in. However, there are 10 forms in which mistakes have been made. Either the entries have been incorrect or some entries have been left blank. So with this data, let's discuss the concept of DPO and DPMO. The blank or inaccurate entries or incorrect entries are defects, defects in the form, filled in form. The 10 forms have one or more defect. These forms, because they have one or more defects, they are defective. Because there are 10 defective forms, out of six which were dished out. Therefore, the ratio is 60 upon, 10 upon 60 is equal to 17% or defective rate is 17%. Each form has 20 entries. So the maximum number of mistakes that a student could make in filling the form could be 20 or there could be a maximum of 20 defects. Now, because there are 60 forms and in each form, there could be 20 possible defects. So the total number of defects or maximum possible number of defects in this process could be 60 multiplied by 20 is equal to 1200. These maximum possible number of defects in this process are referred to as defect opportunities. So in this process, the process being the process of filling forms, there are 1200 defect opportunities. We can make, we can draw some more conclusions. Let's say that the total number of defects or mistakes made in those 10 forms which are defective is 12. So 0.2 defects at an average in each form. And here is the main concept, defect per opportunities. There are a total of 12 defects in the entire operation. And the maximum possible number of defects in the whole process could have been 12. So this provides us a ratio. We divide 
the number of defects, actual number of defects and maximum possible number of defects, we get a figure of 0 0.01 or 1% or 10 per thousand or 10,000 per million. This is how per thousand and per million indicated. So this simple ratio 0 0.01 or 1% or 10% is referred to as DPO, defect per opportunities. But when you extend the scale to 1 million, then DPO becomes DPMO or defects per million opportunities. So if these farms were distributed in bulk to a large number of people in a way that there could have been a maximum of million defects, then this particular operation would yield 10,000 defects in those amongst those maximum possible 1 million defects. Just to give you an example, what does this signify? In three sigma process, the DPO or defect per opportunities is 0 0.002699 or 0 0.2699% call it 0.3 or 3 per thousand, which gives us a DPMO of 3,000 or 2,699 to be precise. What does this mean? It means if you are carrying out any process and there is a chance of making or there is a potential of making one million mistakes or there is a chance of a maximum of one million defects and you have or your process has actually yielded 2699 defects then your process is a three sigma process in this process of fast process of filling forms we have achieved a figure of 10,000 DPMO. That if there were million opportunities, defect opportunities possible, then this process has only created 10,000 of them. So in the parlance of sigma levels, this corresponds to a level of 2.6. So 10th in our process of filling forms is 2.6 sigma. So this is the concept of DPO and DPMO. Obviously, lower this figure, higher the sigma level or the quality level of the process. Next is the concept of lower and upper specification limits and lower and upper control limits. Uh, this would be illustrated better with an example. Let us say you own a sports factory in Sialkot. And your factory has landed a huge order from FIFA to manufacture 100,000 footballs for them. And they have given you their specifications. They say, that the footballs, when inflated uh, to a pressure, an air pressure of, let's say, 0.6 to 1.1 atmospheres at mean sea level, the weight of the football should be 430 grams. But because there is a variation in the atmosphere, in, in the pressure to which the footballs will be inflated between 0 0.6 uh, to 1.1 atmospheres, and of course, given the, given the fact that there could be a variation by the plant um, or there could be a manufacturing variation also, 
FIFA has said, okay, uh, you can uh, manufacture these footballs between limits of 410 grams and 450 grams. So we have got a tolerance from 410 and, and 450 grams. And the, and the mid, midpoint or the ideal weight of the football is to be 430 grams. In fact, this is actually uh, FIFA's rule number two on the size and weight of the football. So these specifications, which FIFA, the customer has dictated, are referred to as the upper and lower specification limits. So 410 gram would be the low, upper lower specification limit and 450 would be the upper specification limit. The ideal weight being 430 gram. You can also refer to as the customer's requirements as we understand in the process of collect requirements in the scope management knowledge area. Having received FIFA order and, and the customer requirement, by the way, these specification limits are also referred to as the voice of the customer because this is what the customer demands. This is the requirement of the customer. So having received this FIFA's order, then you would look at your own capability. Are you capable of producing footballs between 410 and 450 grams? Is your plant capable? Is your plant new or old? So these are some of the factors which then come to your mind. Let us say, uh, before this order, you executed a similar order for Asian Football Federation. And there you found that you had manufactured footballs between 400 and 440 grams with an average of 420 grams. Let me repeat. The previous order, which was with Asian Football Federation, you manufactured footballs between control limits of 400 and 440 grams uh, with a mean of 420 grams. Let's take the mean first. FIFA, FIFA's mean is 430. This mean is 420. That means our mean has drifted. FIFA's upper control limit was 450 grams. What you manufactured for Asian Football Federation was 440 grams. Oh, that's very good. You did not exceed that limit. But then come to the lower control limit. FIFA's limit, rule two, is 410 grams. You went as far as 400 grams. So that means all those footballs which weighed between 400 and 410 grams were rejected or would be rejected in the quality control process. We will come to this aspect uh, more when we discuss the bell curve. But the point is that you should have the capability to fulfill, to fulfill the requirements of the customer. If the specification limits are the voice of the customer, then the control limits or the process between 400 and 440 grams, which you achieve, is the voice of the process, because this is what your capability is. So in short, voice of the customer is the customer's requirement and voice of the process is your capability. We'll revert to this aspect when we discuss the uh, bell curve. The next concept is standard deviation. Standard deviation tells us about dispersion. How closely knit or how dispersed the data is, that for that, one of the measures of performance is standard deviation. And of course, there are many others like range. Range is the extent of data or the difference between the maximum and the minimum values. 
you also learned uh, Pearson's coefficient in regression. That is also uh, an indicator of dispersion. But here we will take standard deviation in a, in a different context. Uh, to be very sure, let's do a little example. Let's say there's, this is a data set, two, four, 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 five, five, seven, nine. This could be anything. These could be measurements uh, of anything. This could be discrete data. This could be anything. Let's try to work out standard deviation of this data set to see uh, whether this data set is closely knit or it is widely dispersed. If you look at uh, another uh, indicator, uh, the range, the minimum value is two, the maximum is nine, so the range is nine, which is pretty significant. So let's see if this is also supported by standard deviation. Okay, this is how we proceed. We first of all take the average or mean of this data. So we add them all up, they are eight. When we add them all up, it is 40, there are eight of them. So we, the mean is 40 divided by eight, five. From here on, the procedure for finding out standard deviation is exactly the same as the procedure for finding out root mean square error. So what we do is we find the variance of every point from the mean. So the point is here is value is two, the mean is five, so the variance is two minus five or five minus five, doesn't matter because we are going to ultimately square it, so sign doesn't matter. So here we are, we, are, we have taken variances of each number with respect to the mean, which is five. We take its square and then sum it. Five minus two is the variance, then we square the variance. That is why it is called the square of variances and what we are doing, taking the sum of square of variances or abbreviated to SSV. And this figure comes to 32. Then we take the mean of the sum of square of variances. Uh, this is also referred to in very simple terms, the variance. So the mean of SSV or the mean of square of variances is also called the variance. So this is 32, the sum of square of variances. So what is the mean variance? There are eight of them. So divide by eight, we take it four. So four is the variance. We take the square root of the variance of this figure. Under root four, we get a figure of plus minus two. So the standard deviation is two. Is it significant? Yes, it is, because it is as much as the value of one of the data values. So it is a very high standard deviation for this data set, which was also substantiated by the range, which was nine minus two, seven. In, before we shift the slide, there is a definite relationship between standard deviation and the variance. We took a square root of variance, so that means standard deviation is the square root of variance, or variance is the square of standard deviation, and this is exp expressed uh, in this box over here. So variance is equal to square of standard deviation, or standard deviation is the square root of variance. Now we come to a very important uh, concept in control charts, the concept of normal distribution and the bell curve. Let's say you are given a target, a gun and 100 bullets to shoot at this target. You could be a professional, you could be a novice, you could be amateur, a shooter, doesn't matter. You are given one gun, 100 bullets and this target and you carry out a shoot and you expect this sort of performance. What you can do is find out the standard deviation of your shoot. How will you do that? Take any point, for example, this one here. 
take its various what is the mean the mean is the bullseye smack in the middle so take this distance take it square do it for all other points take the sum then take the mean and then take the square root so that will be the standard deviation of your shoot and in fact nowadays if you go to shooting ranges most of the shooting ranges have computerized targets the moment you hit uh, you automatically your data is already gener uh, automatically generated and it gives you your standard deviation whatever is your standard deviation you draw circles of your standard deviation draw first circle from the bullseye draw first circle with a radius of one standard deviation the second circle with a radius of radius of two standard deviations and the third circle with a radius of three standard deviations and the results you will find would be very interesting this is what you will find this is the first standard deviation the second standard deviation and the third standard deviation so what is so interesting about this result well the interesting thing is that 68 of those 100 bullets have landed within the first circle or first standard deviation then another 27 bullets have landed between the first standard deviation and the second standard deviation circle making a total of 68 plus 27 95 bullets lying within two standard deviations and then you will find that another four bullets have landed between the third, second and third standard deviation so add 4.3 to 95.4 you get 99.7 percent on your 99 or let's say almost 100 percent bullets or 100 bullets have landed inside three standard deviation and only 0.3 percent lie outside i said you could be a novice you could be an amateur you could be a professional you will have more or less the same shoot the point is the only difference is that in case of a professional the standard deviation will be very small it would be a much compressed shoot but in case of an amateur or novice the standard deviation would be large or the spread would be large if we were to construct a graph of this let's put a number line over here this is the bullseye or the middle or the mean which is uh, uh, denoted by the greek letter mu and this is the first uh, first standard deviation circle or first sigma circle this is the second and this is the third now let's do one thing more let us assume that you were given 1000 bullets and not 100 bullets so if you were given 1000 bullets these would become 682 bullets 272 bullets and 43 bullets and the situation will be as indicated in this table so between mu mu means bullseye between bullseye and one sigma there would be 602 bullets between one and two sigma 272 bullets this one here and between two and three sigma 43 bullets and of course uh, three bullets would be outside the outside three standard deviation because we have dropped all these bullets or raised all these bullets to this line and we are now discussing the data left or right of this center line 
So how many bullets would be to the left of the center line? We take half of this, 341 to the left, 341 to the right. Half of this, 136 to the left, 136 to the right. Uh, let's say 21 and a half bullets. Let's say there are, it is possible to divide the bullets into two. Let's for the time being assume that. So 21.5 bullets to the left of this center line and 21.5 bullets to the right of the center line out, outside this circle. Okay, let us now create jars. We want to collect these bullets and we want to collect, put these bullets in their respective jars. So this will be the jar for the bullets which lie to the right of the center line within the first standard deviation. This will be the jar for the bullets which lie again to the right of the bullseye, uh, but between the first and st second standard deviation. And this is the jar which lies to the right, well, for the bullets which lie to the right of the center line between second and third standard deviation. And likewise, we have three more jars for the left of our center line. Let's now put these bullets in their respective jars. We have got this data. Let's take the right hand side. Uh, let's take the first one between the center line to the right and to the left. We have 341, 341, and this is the situation. So these the two jars get filled up to this level. Now let's take first and second standard deviation. This circle here, there were 272 bullets in total, 136 on either side. So let's fill in, and these are the jars, pink jars for them, and they get filled up to this level, 136. And finally, we have these brown jars, and left and right, we have 21.5 bullets each. We have segregated this in terms of discrete data, one standard deviation, two standard deviations, three standard deviations. What if we take the continuous data? We take even fractions, 1.1 standard deviation, 1.2 standard deviation, you will agree then in that case, the number of deviations would be infinite or the number of jars in that case would be infinite. And if there are infinite number of jars and these fillings, then we could draw a smooth curve through the tops of those jars and this is what is referred to as the bell curve. And of course, this bell curve has limits, upper control limit and lower control limit, and everything underneath this, which in this case is the number, is the total number of bullets out of 1,000, they lie underneath it, what is also referred to as the area of the curve. And if you see minutely, uh, what, what is discarded over here is in fact compensated over here. What is discarded over here is compensated over here. What is discarded over here is compensated over here. So this is the known, well-known bell curve. It is known as the bell curve because it is shaped like a bell, like the church bell. Here is a better depiction of the bell curve that was drawn by me. This is, this is what uh, I have taken from the internet. So this is a good figure of a bell curve, uh, clearly indicating the first standard deviation, the second data in between the second standard deviations and the third standard deviations and the limits and 99.7% data lying within these two limits. This fact, which we have dis just discussed, 99.7% data lying within three standard deviations 
has very important implications in control charts. In a way, we can say that if these are the limits, this is the ideal, this is the mean, and these are the limits of any process, then 100% or 99% of the data lies between these two limits. And this is the corresponding bell curve to suggest the same. This is the graph, and this is, of course, showing you the limits in a different perspective. Whenever 99.7% data lies within three standard deviation, the distribution is referred to as the normal distribution. All control charts use this fact that 99.7% data lies within three standard deviations. So the control limits of all control charts are usually set at plus three standard deviations or plus three sigma and minus three standard deviations or minus three sigma. Now let's discuss the previous concept of upper and lower specification limits and upper and lower control limits in the context of control charts. Let us say a deliverable is being created and it has to have a weight of 100 grams with a tolerance or within limits of plus minus 10 grams. So these are the specification limits. Upper specification limit would be 110, lower specification limit would be 90. Because the distance between the mean and the outer specification limit is three standard deviations. So that means three standard deviations is equal to 10 grams. So what is one standard deviation? 10 grams divided by three. So 3.3 grams is the standard deviation. Or let us say 3.3 grams is the required standard deviation of the process. If the process exceeds 3.3 grams standard, uh, or the standard deviation of the process, actual process exceeds 3.33 grams, then that there would be rejections in that process. For that, for the production to be acceptable, your process should yield a standard deviation which is less than 3.33. So let's see this. This is the mean. 100 grams, and because it is plus minus 10 grams, so upper specification limit is 110 grams, lower specification limit is 90. This, this amounts to three standard deviations, so 10 grams amount to three standard deviations, so one standard deviation amounts to 3.33 gram, or if you were to divide this into three, each unit would be uh, 3.33 grams apart. So that this is what the customer's requirement is. This is what the voice of the customer is. Now let us compare this with your actual performance. Let us say the actual performance is this. What do we find here? We find that our control limits are outside the specification limits. What does that indicate? That means our process is going beyond the specification limits. What it implies is that anything that goes outside the specification limits, like this bit here and this bit here, or the items falling in this area, would be straightway rejected in the quality control. In this particular case, we are thinking of 4.3% rejections, which is a fairly large number of rejections, considering that in a three sigma process, the maximum rejections that are allowed are three. Here it is 4.3. So this, is, this process is well below three sigma. In fact, Compared to the standard deviation, if we look, the control limits are 15 grams, both upper and lower control limits are 50 gram, 15 grams from the 
mean. But because this is three standard deviations, so 15 grams divided by three makes it five grams. So the standard deviation of our process is five gram, which is more than what was required, which was 3.3 gram. So obviously this process is prone to high levels of rejections in quality control. We are going to keep the specification limits the same and going to look at another process. See, the specification limits are the same. This is another process. What do we find here? We find here, number one, that the control limits are inside the specification limits. That means our process is within the boundaries defined by the customer. Statistically, what we find that the upper control limit is at 107.5, that means 7.5 grams from the mean, and the same thing on the left-hand side. 7.5 grams is three standard deviations. So what is one standard deviation? 7.5 divided by three, 2.5. So the standard deviation of this process is 2.5 grams. What was required was 3.3 grams because our actual standard deviation is less than what was required. So everything produced by this process will be accepted by the quality control. So we draw two important conclusions here. Number one, the control limits in red must lie inside the specification limits shown in blue. And statistically, the standard deviation of the process should be less than the required standard deviation or the maximum permissible standard deviation. These are very important conclusions, particularly uh, in the production processes. Next, we move to the concept of shift and dispersion. Take any process. This is the bell curve of that process, and this is the mean or mu, or it is also indicated with a bar. The mean is 70, 70 anything, 70 centimeters, 70 grams, 70 tons, doesn't matter. This is what is required. If, however, the process yields a different mean, as shown in the figure, a mean of 90, the blue process is yielding a mean of 90 and the red process is yielding a, a mean of 50. We say that the process has undergone a shift. If this process has yielded a mean of 90, that means this process has shifted to the right by 20 grams or 20 centimeters and likewise, this red process has shifted in the other direction. Then dispersion tells us the spread. Remember we talked about a novice, an amateur and a professional shooter. Their shoots differ only to the extent of dispersion. Of course, accuracy also, or, or the shift also, you need, a, a professional would have a mean uh, at 70, and amateur and novices in blue or red. But coming to the spread of the bullets, if X bar indicates one spread of bullets, and let's say he's a professional, then this will be the performance by uh, uh, an amateur and the red will be the performance by the novice. So as the spread increases, the bell curve collapses. Why should it collapse? Because the number of bullets fired by each are the same or area under the curve is the same. So if this graph, if this bell curve is to spread, it must collapse so as to preserve the area under the curve. So this 
So what conclusion we draw? When the dispersion increases, or when the bell curve becomes fatter, it becomes shorter. When the dispersion reduces, the bell curve uh, becomes taller. This is pretty much what uh, this text says. Shift and dispersion can also be discussed in terms of accuracy and precision. In fact, shift is accuracy and dispersion is precision. And this is indicated over here. Let's take uh, uh, four target shoots, in which four bullets were fired by different people, by different shooters. Look at this shoot. The mean of this is smack in the bullseye, so there is no shift. Look at the spread. The spread is very short, very small. Small dispersion. When there is little or no shift, we say the shoot is accurate. And when there is very little dispersion, we say the shoot is precise. So this is a case of accuracy as well as precision. Come here. The same bullets, but they are found over here. So what is the mean? The mean is over here. That means the mean is displaced. So there is a large shift. But the shoot is very nicely grouped together. The data is very close to each other. The dispersion is very small. Small dispersion means, again, it is a precise shoot. But because the mean is away, it is not accurate. So this is a case of no accuracy, but precision. And you can see this also from, from this. Oh, uh, I did not explain this. In this case, the bell curve is tall, slim, and sitting smack on the middle, on the bullseye. In this case, the, the graph has, the, the bell curve has shifted to one side. That means it is not accurate but it is still slim and smart. That means it is precise. Or this is a case of precision, but not accuracy. Let's take this case. If we take the mean of this data, it is almost in the middle. So we say either there is no shift or very small shift, which means it is an accurate shoot. But look at precision, look at dispersion. It is all over the place. In fact, the bell curve is sitting on the, on the middle, but it is flat. It has collapsed. And because it has, why it has collapsed? Because, it, because of loss, dispersion in, all, in order, to preserve the area under the curve, it has collapsed. So it is a fat and short bell curve. Come to this. Where is the mean? The mean is about here. So there is a large shift. It is not accurate. Sorry, going to the, back to the previous case. This is a case of accuracy, but no precision. Accurate because there is no shift or very little shift. Not precise because the dispersion is large as also indicated by this bell curve. In this case, this is the mean. So the shift has displaced. Therefore, it is not accurate. Large shift, not accurate. What about precision? It's the same data. There is uh, uh, large dispersion, therefore the data is not, or the shoot is not precise. So this is a case of neither accuracy nor precision. So shift relates to accuracy and dispersion relates to 
decision. I will now show you an Excel sheet to show this uh, concept a little dynamically. Okay, this is a bell curve developed in the Excel sheet. Uh, it is sitting uh, at 800, so mean is 800. And at the moment, it has, in its present configuration, a standard deviation of seven. These are the buttons uh, which will move this curve. Let's shift the mean, left and right. So when we do that, it has become 90. And you see the bell curve has shifted to 90. Shift it more, 80, 70, 60. So the process is shifting and we could take it to the other side also. Back to 70, back to 80, back to 90, back to the original mean and back to the, not to the right side. So you can, what you just saw on the, on the screen was the, the process or the bell curve shifting or the mean of the, of the process shifting. What if we temper with the standard deviation? If we increase the standard deviation, that means the data is dispersing, you would expect the graph to collapse. Let's increase the standard deviation. Eight, see it collapsing? Nine, collapsing further. 10, 11, 12. So the bell curve is now becoming uh, what we people look like after eating a valina. It is becoming fatter and fatter. And because it has to preserve the area under the curve, it is also collapsing. What if we reduce the standard deviation? It becomes taller and slimmer, taller and slimmer, slimmer taller and slimmer, taller and slimmer, taller and slimmer, taller and slimmer. Taller and slimmer. Taller and slimmer, taller and slimmer, taller and slimmer, taller and slimmer. Let's take it one, it goes through the roof. So this is the concept of dispersion and shift. And of course, it can be both dispersion as well as shift. Uh, it, could, it could be shifting and becoming taller, or it could be becoming fatter and shifting. So the, the both can act together also and in isolation also. So that was the concept of shift and dispersion. I have taken uh, some time to explain this because there are separate charts for shift and dispersion. Let's uh, change the screen again and go back to our presentation. Now we come to uh, some of the rules of control charts. Uh, this is a typical, uh, what I will show you now is a typical control chart and apply uh, rules uh, for control charts, or let's say out of control rules. Uh, let's put uh, the specification limits over here first. So this is the voice of the customer. He wants ideally something at 59.95, but he has set an upper limit of 16.2 and a lower limit of 15. So, and let's say you have uh, you have delivered him the deliverables, uh, and the, this is the, the this is the data uh, of the deliverables you have produced for him. Now, at a cursory look, it looks like a very good performance because all the performance lies within the specification limits. The standard deviation appears to be good. And all these deliverables, because they lie inside the specification limits, are likely to clear the validate scope and they are likely to be accepted by the quality control people of the customer. At least this is what the graph suggests. But hang on, let us see how 
this process has performed by plotting the control limits. This is the center line. This is this shaded is the three sigma band or three standard deviations. This darker shade represents the region of two standard deviations. And the third, the darkest shade is the region of one standard deviation. This is the bell curve of the process. First thing first, what central line or what mean we have achieved 15.93. Well, it is close enough to 15.95 because the shift is very small. This is the shift. Ideal was 15.95. We have achieved 15.93. So very good. The production process is very good. But hang on. What is this gentleman doing over here? It is outside the control limits. Why did our process which was very falling gracefully, the center line, zigzagging around the center line, suddenly went out of the lower control limit. Whenever that happens, we carry out root cause analysis to find out why. We apply one of those techniques which we learned in root cause analysis to find out why this thing happened. Because where, as this is a natural process going on. These are the natural reasons for variation. This is not natural. It is lying outside the control limit. So it has to be an uncommon cause or an assignable cause. So this needs to be investigated. Okay. Now look at these data sets over here. Was this to happen or was this data required to zigzag around the center line. This shows that this data, for some reason, is heading towards the lower control limit. Either the machine has a runaway or the operator of that machine has gone to sleep, something has happened. And the process is rapidly drawing towards the lower control limit and over here, Either the machine or the operator realizes, ah, there's something going wrong. So he takes a drastic control action and reverses the process. Whenever this thing happens, that a series of data points head towards either the lower control limit or towards the upper control limit, this is referred to as trend. Again, this is to be investigated because this is taking the data outside the lower control, although the data is still inside the control limits. But remember, I mentioned about some red dots within these, uh, within the control limits. This precisely is the case. This price, this precisely is the manifestation of that. Although the data is lying inside the control limits, but this data is to be considered red dots. Normally, a set of seven data points, or if this thing happens with seven data points consecutively, it is considered to be a trend. But it is not hard and fast. With a new machine, even two or three data points going in the same direction should alert you. And if it is an old plant, perhaps even eight or nine shouldn't bother you because it is an old plant. It, is a, it has undergone a gradual degradation. So this is referred to as trend. Trend is when data points start heading towards one of the control limits, although still within the control limits. Then look at these points over here. They are not zigzagging around this line, center line. They have developed their own center line. So they have developed a separate center line over here or in other words the process has undergone a shift this is referred to as the shift or run and this again needs to be investigated uh, 
again a set of the same data points on the same side of the central line is considered to be a run but again this is not hard and fast if this is a new machine or this if this happens with a new machine or a new plant uh, then even two or three points on the same side if they don't zigzag around the mean uh, should give you a cause of concern but if this is an old machine perhaps you will go beyond seven so whereas in conclusion whereas this appeared to be a good process and one would which would certainly be accepted by the uh, or the deliverers or which lead to deliverables which would certainly be accepted by the customer in the validate scope process as a project manager or as a production manager you are not happy with the situation because your process has gone out of control thrice over here over here and over here so these were the basic concepts uh, which are the building blocks of any control charts and uh, we have discussed with them and with that we can now look at what are the types of control charts or what i call the control chart breakdown structure let's start with the first argument what is the type of data we are dealing with is it continuous data measurable data or is it discrete data let us say it is measurable or continuous data then the next question to ask is do we want a control chart for shift or do we want for dispersion whether we want it for shift or dispersion the next argument is what is the size of the sample remember we have to create charts for shift and dispersion if the sample size is 1 we will have a chart called xmr chart for shift and there is no chart for dispersion if the sample size is 9 or less between 2 and 9 then for shift the chart to be used is called x bar r chart and for dispersion r chart r stands for range so for dispersion the argument will be the range of the data set and for shift it will be x bar what is x bar bar means the mean these are also shift charts are also referred to as the mean charts because we take the mean what is x x is the data or the measurement of the sample it could be height weight breaking strength whatever so you take the height or weight or the breaking strength of the of all the items in the sample let's say there are four items in the sample sample size is four so you take the measurement of all the four which is donated by x and then take the mean that is referred to as the sample mean sample mean coupled with the range of the sample is used to create a shift chart again this will become very clear when we actually take the charts if the sample size is greater than 9 that means 10 or more then instead of range we use standard deviation so the shift chart becomes the mean of the sample coupled with standard deviation not the range and likewise the dispersion chart we use again standard deviation and not the range going back on top if the data is attribute or discrete then the argument is whether this data pertains to defects or defectives 
There are separate charts for defects or defectives. But in either case, we find whether the sample size is fixed or it is variable. If the sample size is fixed, the chart to use is the C chart, and the sample chart, if the sample size is variable, the chart to use is the U chart. And likewise, for the defectives, NP chart, if the sample size is fixed, and P chart for variable sample size. Due to paucity of time, we are not going to discuss this. I'm going to confine this uh, session to these two charts and these four charts. So in the next session, we'll take the charts, the shift and dispersion charts. And in the final ch session, we'll take the charts for defects and defectives. With that, we come to the end of this session. And in the next session, as I said earlier, we'll take uh, the charts, the poll charts for shift and dispersion. So until then, Allah Hafiz. <laughs>